computer is an invaluable tool for processing these millions of bits of information in accurate, fast, and economical fashion, in accordance with rules and instructions provided by the human programmer. Good evening. Oh, I'm sorry. My father is fairly deaf, so I speak loudly. My name is Paul Holdengraber, and I'm the director of public programs here at the New York Public Library. Known as Live from the New York Public Library, as you know, my goal here at the library is quite simply to make the lions roar, to make a heavy institution dance, and when successful, to make it levitate. I encourage you all to come next week and hear Marcus Samuelson and come to our last event. Marcus Samuelson is on Monday. I'll be speaking to him. And on Tuesday, to close our season, we have the pleasure of having Chris Weir and Zadie Smith. I would also like to encourage you all to become members of the library, to join our email list so that you may find out who is coming next year. I will just give you a little teaser, a little foretaste. Many, many, many people I won't announce now to keep the suspense going. But I'll tell you the first event and the last event. And since a book is what happens between the covers, you'll have to imagine the rest. So we will have on at the end of January, to keep the suspense going, not telling you the date exactly, we'll have John Irving. And at the very end... I'll be interviewing Toni Morrison. Tonight, it's a great pleasure to welcome back David Byrne, who has been at the library. We didn't quite know how many times, but two or three times. I had the great pleasure of welcoming David Byrne at my previous place of employment, which was the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in Los Angeles. And David Byrne came to give an extraordinary talk I will never, ever forget called I Love PowerPoint, but it wasn't called I Love. You see how it, each time it works. It wasn't I Love PowerPoint. It was very clear that when I put I Love PowerPoint, um, this was not the right way to qualify it. It was I Heart PowerPoint. And I remember a website at that point, completely unknown to me, called Boing Boing, put it on their site, and my goodness, within five minutes, we were totally, absolutely sold out, and half of Silicon Valley came to find out why David Byrne loved PowerPoint. <laughs> and um, to this day, I don't know if David Byrne loves PowerPoint. At any rate, it was a fantastically interesting conversation, uh, uh, interesting talk, and tonight I'm very interested by the conversation that David Byrne will have with Chris Ruin. Now, they haven't really met much before, so it will be a conversation that will happen in front of you as they discover the passion they have for music and copyright in the digital era. Now, both of them have books, and I encourage you to get those books afterwards from our independent bookseller. I'm very much in favor of independent booksellers. Chris Ruin's book is called Free Loading, how, uh, how Our Insatiable Hunger for Free Content Starves Creativity. And David Byrne's book, Three Words, How Music Works. Now, over the past few years, about five, I've asked my guests to give me a biography of themselves, a haiku of sorts, so if you're very modern, a tweet in seven words to define themselves or not define themselves. Chris Ruin gave me these seven words. Apathetic, very hard to do with my lisp. Apoplectic, diuretic, antiseptic, bored, anxious, and beer. <laughs> After the conversation, uh, both David Byrne and Chris Ruin will welcome your questions over 
the years, I've discovered that questions can be asked in about 52 seconds. And there'll be a mic put right there in front of the stage. So we ask you to come up to the mic and ask brilliant questions. David Byrne was unable to define himself in 10 words. He gave me more words. So, and I, instead of cutting one or two out randomly, I'm going to read all of them as I bring them both to the stage. David Byrne defines himself thus. Unfinished, unprocessed, uncertain, unknown, unadorned, under arms, underpants, <laughs> unfrozen, unsettled, and finally, to bring them both on stage, unfussy. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start. Uh, in, in my beginning is sort of going to be a, an introduction to Chris. Um, we really are going to talk sort of about this one subject. Uh, I hope that's okay. I've, <laughs> I've <laughs> been doing these kind of conversations around the country and it's been a lot of fun, and everyone's been very different. I, I did one with uh, uh, neuroscientists and uh, other musicians and uh, with a various people who run small record labels and things like that, and the only place I ever got heckled was in Glasgow, which is where my relatives live. <laughs> and it was for exactly that reason the person heckling thought uh, I was going to do a, some sort of career retrospective. And no, we're really going to talk about this subject of um, copyright and downloading and all, all that sort of thing. Um, where, do, where do I start? Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> not too long ago, um, Chris's publisher sent me his book, and I read it, and I liked it very much. Uh, and I had also gotten in touch with another guy, David Lowry, who's traveling, a, a, in, a, in a way, a similar path. These are people who kind of maybe come out of the indie music scene, I would say kind of in various capacities, who have come forward to kind of say um, the kind of... The idea that all content, music included, of course, should be free maybe hasn't worked out in, in the way that some people hoped it would do or way, the way we were promised. Um, I'm a musician who's been around for quite a long time, so I have a foothold. It's not, it, to be honest, it's not so much about me. I'm doing okay. Thank you. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more about uh, musicians who are emerging, who are just getting a foothold, um, and how will they manage to make a life, a living, a family, whatever, in music. Anyway, maybe Chris can yeah. take over where, for a bit. So, sort of where I came into this... Uh, this whole debate and this whole issue was um, not... I, basically, I, if anyone had told me that I would end up writing a book about copyright or about um, music piracy uh, or technology, I never would have believed it. Um, but music maybe isn't so surprising. That, I was an obsessive music fan growing up, and uh, uh, in 2000, which is really when Napster peaked, I was a college student and a freshman in college, actually. And, uh, you know, like all of my peers, we would download lots of free music. And nobody had any problems with it. There were no real ethical conversations 
to have. Also at that time, there was no iTunes store. So actually, if you wanted an MP3, um, th there, wasn't, there wasn't a legitimate source that you could go to um, to buy it. So there was sort of an argument for why this was so pervasive. But anyway, we weren't, nobody was worried about artists making money or anything like that. Um, I had sort of my own um, feelings as a, as a music buyer that I noticed um, if I would purchase an album, even if I didn't like it on the first listen, uh, even if I hated it on the first listen, if I paid $15 for it, I would listen to it at least three times. And sometimes it would grow on me and it would become an album that I loved. So, and also I was just more invested in it. So um, I sort of had my personal feelings about why I would still pay for music. But uh, overall, this, this huge debate over piracy was starting. You know, the Metallica was, they were labeled as these, you know, uh, I, I, I'm trying not to swear. I don't know if it's something <laughs> I shouldn't be doing. These rich people who were not sympathetic, let's say that. And uh, that was just accepted by, by my peer group. And, and, and I recognize, like, I love music, and I have my relationship with it, and I don't want to worry about this issue at all. So even though I wrote about music, I wrote for different websites. When I moved to New York, I wrote for the New York Press. Um, I wasn't really paying attention to this issue um, until... Uh, about 2008, 2009, I was working in, I, I live in Brooklyn, I live in Greenpoint, and uh, I was working at a cafe, and I sort of lucked into working at this place where all of these different musicians um, who were getting a lot of press and attention would come in, they were just regulars, and I got to know them a little bit. And I recognized that uh, they seemed, I mean, maybe not, I didn't have this information on everybody, but I, I sort of figured out that um, they were pretty broke, and they were probably about as broke as I was, and I was a barista. And, you know, go back a few years when I was in college, some of these same musicians I was finding out about through media, just as a fan, and I was very excited about them, and to me they seemed like, oh, great, this band's making it, this is... Uh, this is very exciting, and you know, I'm happy to see it. This is creative music, so I, I'm happy that this is getting an audience. And uh, I, I, so anyway, that, that really brought it home for me, the fact that all was not it appeared on the surface. And um, so I, I looked at my own habits in a different way, and I looked at the wider discussion, or lack thereof, on this issue in a very different way. And um, you know, the, the big thing, the big balloon, it sort of, exploded was uh, this idea that it was about Metallica or that it was that this issue was about these greedy millionaires who are trying to keep kids from just sharing music with one another. I, I want to interrupt about the Metallica thing because some of you may not know what that reference is. Metallica is a, a very successful kind of hard rock metal band and they sort of <laughs> led the ch charge back in like 2001, yep. 2000, 2001. 2001. They sort of led the charge against Napster the file sharing peer-to-peer -peer site, and uh, they testified at Congress and, and everything like that. And to a lot of people like Chris and I, um, the fact that they were very successful, probably we assumed had a lot of money, and that we may be, I'm speaking for myself, we're not like the super biggest fans of Metallica. We probably, and our peers probably just thought, what a bunch of jerks, just, right. just yeah, trying yeah. to, yep. you know, get more money for themselves. Right. Uh, at least that's the way it appeared to us. Yeah. And then, you know, what, what also happened was that no other, you know, some people at that time ex predicted that, um, uh, there's one guy, Jonathan Taplin, who I think is a pretty famous manager in the music industry, and he said, okay, well, you can portray Lars Ulrich and Metallica as these, you know, these out-of-touch old guys who have too much money, who have six houses, but what about when Ray Charles or Aretha Franklin start to raise a fuss about this? Then we'll have this conversation about what's right and what's fair. But that never happened. No other artists after Metallica uh, really did talk about this issue and this sort of culture of fear um, you know, uh, was perpetuated. And then the lack of the artist voice let, you know, for people like me as a, a consumer and a fan, since I wasn't hearing artists complain about it, and I think this was true for a lot of my peers, we just assumed everything's okay. You know, these artists must be doing all right. If this was a problem, piracy, they would be saying something about it. 
Um, but it, you know, going back to what I was saying, the uh, once I realized that Metallica. I mean, using Metallica as an example for a musician is like using, um, I don't know, Bernie Madoff as an example. Well, he's a, let's not use Bernie Madoff. <laughs> <laughs> Warren Buffett is an example of a small businessman. You know, it's like the glaring exception to the rule. Metallica, I think, is the seventh highest selling band in American history. So the idea that they became the symbol for musicians is pretty ridiculous. And I saw that most musicians are just like everybody. They're struggling to pay rent. They're struggling to make a living. So I thought, well, what is the argument for not respecting the rights of this you know, great majority of, of artists and musicians? What is that argument? And what's the argument for letting these websites charge advertising on the work of these people who, um, who are struggling? And uh, so everything just sort of broke down for me, and I started you know, evaluating the issue and and in that time, when I was having my own kind of, you know, set of realizations on this, um, there were all these things happening in the music industry. I don't know if should we do the slides? Sure. Okay. I made I made PowerPoint slides because <laughs> I really Back to the PowerPoint. I really do love PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> um, but part of what Chris was saying um, about that musicians weren't speaking out a lot about this was, well. The, the Metallica and a bunch of the record labels and whatever, they succeeded in shutting down Napster. And, but a bunch of other offshore sites sprung up. Not, it didn't take very long. Whether and it's onshore sites. I'd yeah, onshore, it. offshore, other based in other countries, based in who knows where, but they all s s to kind of do the same thing. And, uh, and they sl slight variations on how it was done, but it was basically the same thing to trade or basically you could go there and download movies and music and mm, you said books. Oh yeah, books. books yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, electronic books. Oh, yeah. And um, all that kind of thing. So it, it didn't really put a stop to it and musicians have been kind of just going along with it and wondering and just kind of accepting this is the brave new shitty world that we <laughs> live in. <laughs> so I can swear. Yes, I guess. Good. Oh. I'm much more comfortable. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, Chris's book and kind of there's a kind of a seems to be a little movement, a little zeitgeist happening where uh, people who don't really represent, you know, huge mega successful bands, but are genuine kind of music fans and kind of are c in some ways fans of kind of struggling musicians are, are saying, wait a minute, this wasn't, this isn't just a kind of a, a drop in income for huge rock dinosaurs. This is a drop in income that is very, uh, ha has a huge effect on artists, writers, w whatever, who are trying to get just a leg up and get to the first rung. So I have some pictures. I don't know if everybody can see the, the numbers and stuff in the back, but maybe it doesn't matter. I can uh, go through it very, very quickly. The big peak there where it goes to the top is uh, 2,000, and that, that was CD sales. And, and I think many, many people, myself included, would feel that CDs were vastly overpriced. Um, especially after the cost of making them came down. But the record companies were making a lot of money on this, as you could see. This was like, they were making more money on this than ever before. Uh, but then it all sort of started coming down. And we're not saying that, oh, that it tumbles down because of piracy and file sharing, but... Not exclusively. Not exclusively. This is a chart that shows um, what format, what form music uh, is principally bought in. And the big blue ocean there is albums. And you can see that for many, 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 many dec decades, or quite a few, eh, two or three maybe, <laughs> 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 albums, 
uh, were the big deal. And then you see at the end where there's a little sort of beach and going down. The and uh, people are starting to buy singles or download single songs in the era of, of automatically buying a dozen songs or ten songs is, is kind of over. This is the same chart but adjusted. It looks almost the same, but it's actually how much people spent per capita, how much of each of us spent on music per year. Adjusted for inflation, too. Yes, which is kind of important. Otherwise, it, otherwise it, it looks quite different. Um, in the kind of vinyl era, what is it, like $26 or something like that? Well, I think we were looking at this before. See, I mean, you can see the, uh, there have been some. 63. Hmm? 60 yeah, 63. Oh, yeah. So the peak of 63, vinyl era, and then cassettes. I mean, the cassette era actually <laughs> was a very troubling time for the music industry in the, in the 80s. Um, and you can see it kind of dipped down there. But that, you know, so that low is at $36, $37. Um, which is still well above where we're at today or where we were at at 2009. I mean, it's, it's probably about yeah, the so same spot. Yes, so it goes up to $71 per person, and then now it's, or well, this was like actually three years ago, it was 26, 26 and it's probably dropped from there. Yeah. Well, this is the sales you can in the, of Union Jacks. <laughs> This is sales in the U.S. from a few, also from a few days, a few years ago. I don't know if you can s see these, but that's kind of uh, album sales and digital sales kind of going. There's a little curve going up, and this chart ends at like 2000, I don't know, nine or something like that. So actually, those lines have now crossed, just barely, and uh, so that more or less the same uh, the same amount of income is coming from digital downloads as from CD sales and that sort of thing but it is way down from what it used to be. Whoops, 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 whoops. Yeah, um, I think the revenues peak in was either in 2000 or 2001, and that was over $14 billion, and now it's well under $7 billion. So it's been pretty serious for the industry at large. Um, still a over $6 billion industry, but... So that was... There's more slides to come, but uh, that was just show what kind of how... S how for anyone who hasn't been hearing the incessant thing the about death how knell. <laughs> yeah, the death knell of the music industry. <laughs> That's kind of w what happened. Um, and I mean, maybe we should, I should say yeah, just for a second. Yeah, the, go ahead. That mentioning before that w we said it's not just piracy, and that may have sounded a little strange because that's, you know, that's what my book is all about and sort of what we're here to discuss, the piracy issue. But another really important thing that happened was um, in the 90s, labels could just put out a CD with a couple of hits and charge $18 for the album, and people would buy it. Um, but with iTunes, now people can just buy those two singles, so instead of getting $18, the label is getting $2. And that certainly has had an effect. You know, it's not... You can't put, all, put it all on piracy. So that change has had an effect. Also, just the, you know, natural tumult that is coming with this transition and you know one of the difficult things about this issue is that um, it, it, when people argue about it oftentimes they're just dealing in hypotheticals they're dealing with things that they'd like to imagine so if you're on one side of it people will be presenting statistics that say oh you know 30 percent or 40 percent or 50 percent of this decline is all from piracy and then on the other side, it seems every couple of years there'll be a study that comes out that claims to portray that um, the most dedicated uh, music pirates actually spend more on music than, um, than the, the normal public, which is just, I mean, if you think about it for a couple of minutes, if that were true, if there was a correlation there, then that chart would have looked very different. You know, it would have been exploding because, you know, piracy is very popular. Um, and actually when the before SOPA and PIPA, which were some very controversial pieces of legislation um, presented last year, the, govern the Government Accountability Office, the, the U.S. government, um, they, were, they looked at the issue to try to figure out, well, what are the costs? What are the economic costs? What are the benefits of this? And they couldn't come up with any answers. Um, they basically said in their final report, we can't find a consistent metric to measure what's going on because, you know, just as 
you know, bringing it back to my story, when I was downloading albums, I can't tell you which albums I would have purchased. I think I would have purchased some of them, but there's no way of knowing. And, and that's just one of the many slippery areas of this issue that um, you can get caught up in. So, um, this is, there are people who kind of, uh, uh, in a certain way, oppose um, any restriction on the internet whatsoever. And I think Chris r refers to them as digital determinists. And uh, so maybe it, at least maybe a, a decade or so ago, um, you started having some of these people basically saying, no, you can't regulate. You can't go against piracy. You can't regulate peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. And you can't do this and that. And in, in a certain way, to someone like me, some of that argument that how can you possibly regulate this? How can you possibly in inhibit the freedom of the internet? It's, it made some sort of sense. I certainly, uh, many of these people, uh, like L Lawrence Lessig and people like that that I've done things with before, I agree with many of the things that they advocate and stand for. They, they advocate um, that shorter copyright terms for creative works, including books. And uh, I think both Chris and I feel that the copyright term has been extended to a point where it can, it does. That is a thing that in inhibits creativity because we can't build on works because they're owned in large part by large, co large corporations. And, and yet some of these same people like Lessig uh, and others advocate, in some ways, they pretty much come out and advocate piracy and saying that, uh, well, stealing uh, copyright material that belongs to other people and then putting it together in new and novel and interesting ways justifies the theft. Um, I think we have, we start to have problems when it goes there. So we it gets a little complicated because we, s we, I think both of us agree with some of the things that some of that world uh, are espousing, and then we, ki we kind of disagree with other things. Um, so it's not just because we might say uh, that, let's say, piracy or this kind of file sharing or indiscriminate downloading of copyright material is hurting kind of creative artists, it doesn't mean we disagree with everything they're saying. Um, it's not necessarily all or nothing. Um, for me, I, and I think Chris points this out in his book as well, uh, uh, one of the, the, the stories or narratives that's told about sharing files and downloading them from the internet is that it's a kind of sharing. And it, it, it builds on the, and it isn't sharing good. When you get a physical book and you read it and you like it, you give it to a friend and go, I love this book. And you've created a bond between you and your friend. You've, you've, and, and besides passing on a creative work that could inspire someone else. Yes, a sale may have been lost, but it's, in, in in this case, one sale. Um, and you, but in, in this course of doing that, or in the case of me as a young man, um, trading records with friends or making cassettes of a record and giving it to a friend, it, it makes a little community. And it's a very, very small community. It's maybe five or six people at the most. Um, I would... I don't have an answer to this, but I would say that that's very, very different in type than the kind of anonymous and humongous uh, kind of piracy sites that exist now. Not only does nobody, do you have no idea who you're getting, where the thing originated from, you know, you're not sharing it with anyone, really. You're just taking it out of, a, reaching into an anonymous pot. 
and taking it. And the other thing that makes it very, very different is many of these sites sell ads. So, and they make millions of dollars off these ads um, because people, they, their eyeballs see the ads as they're plucking stuff out of the pot. When you trade stuff with your friends, there isn't like a little ad that pops up <laughs> alongside your head <laughs> that if you liked that, you might want to buy a garden hose or whatever it might be. There's, none, there's nothing attached. There's no third party that walks away with millions of dollars because you are exchanging stuff with your friends. To me, that's a huge, huge difference. Uh, the fact that this is... It's not the same kind of exchange when it's monetized that way. Um, the now, we can kind of demonize... I'm kind of running on just a little bit. <laughs> we can demonize some of these sites like Pirate Bay or Mega Upload or some of the others, and uh, it's kind of easy to do, but it kind of overlaps. It kind of overlaps into uh, sites and services that probably all of us use all the time, like YouTube. Um, and I don't think they used to quite as much, but YouTube now is full of ads. It's been monetized, and that's also a source where people not only get whatever TV snippets and stuff like that, but probably that's become a way for people to go, you want to hear this song? They put it up on YouTube, and, and that's kind of where it is. Uh, the ISPs, the service providers um, that make money off our data that's flying around the world, they're, they're making money off all these all this streaming and all this other stuff that's going on. Chris pointed out, I know, it wasn't you, it was uh, something you sent me recently that I think <laughs> when um, one of the pirate sites was shut down very briefly in Europe, 35% um, of the data, internet activity. The traffic. Yeah, the internet yeah. traffic in Europe disappeared immediately. And s which means that the ISPs, the various services that these are huge, huge co corporations, they're making their money off this stuff, um, this traffic. And they're not sharing it with the artists either. It's all very complicated. Um, but maybe I ram rambled on well, a little yeah, bit there. I can ra I'll <laughs> ramble for a little while. <laughs> uh, I mean, in terms of that, um, yeah, there's a very strong argument to be made that people talk about in the computer world that hardware needs a killer app. It needs some killer software that everybody wants and everybody wants to use. And um, I think for the first Macs, it was spreadsheets. But um, there's an argument to be made that pirated music was the killer app for the early internet. That's what was driving so much of the demand. And you know, getting back to some of the, the arguments that are, that are made that sort of justify or excuse rampant um, illegal downloading, um, you know, people, people would say for, with a straight face, oh, the in information should be free. This info, you know, it should be open, it should be free. Meanwhile, I'm sure uh, um, about 99% of the people in this room are paying $50 or $60 a month for access um, in one way or another to this information that's supposedly free. You know, so the ISPs have been making lots and lots of money over the years um, and for a long time, they weren't ready to do anything in terms of um, more effectively policing their networks. And uh, I mean, that's what that's what SOPA was about. It was it was a you know there were lots of problems with it, but it was a way to compel ISPs and search engines and establish rules of the road um, for how we can protect artists' rights or or you know contents, big contents rights, depending on how you see it. Um, and like, you know, Lawrence Lessig, he would hold up this non-commercial remixing that's going on on YouTube, and as you were saying, ignoring the fact that it's covered in advertising. Um, you know, one of the, a, a lot of what happens, or what has happened to this issue, which confuses people, is conflation. People have conflated piracy with, um, with other issues that don't necessarily relate, such as the internet revolution in general. 
So people have bought in, like you were saying, I mean, it is a convincing argument, and it certainly was a convincing argument through the 2000s when there's all this change, there's, you know, computers are changing very rapidly, um, we're using computers in different ways, there's a lot of confusion. And people could say, this is a great thing, and somehow if we do something about piracy or respect these rights, this is all going to go away. This, you know, this internet freedom and, and openness and innovation, um, you know, it's going to go by the wayside. When in fact, you know, one of the, my realizations writing this book is what is technology? Technology is, a, you know, a tool. Tools are technology, all tools. So one example I use in the book is a hammer. Um, now, you might love hammers and think they're full of great potential, but the fact is the use of the hammer is going to determine how we're, how we're treating you as a citizen under the law. So, yeah, I can build you a house with a hammer, or I can attack you with a hammer. You know, I can, I can violate your rights not to be attacked, and nobody's going to bat an eye when some kind of legal you know, mechanism comes after you. However, when you reapply that same situation to... Um, piracy, which is a case, especially in regard to these distributors who have been making a lot of money off of content and art that they've never invested a penny in. You know, they've never asked any artist whether or not they want to have their stuff on there. Um, when you start saying, hey, maybe this is, is there an excuse for this? Is there an argument for it? Um, then all of a sudden it's censorship. When in fact these are criminal enterprises. You know, if there was a website, foreign website that was facilitating drug sales or something, you know, heroin in the U.S., and that site were taken down, even if it had a cool blog, would we call that censorship? Um, I don't think so. So, but I think part of that is, again, using terms like sharing, um, it's a, you know, freeloading is actually the word I suggest as being a little more accurate for describing what's going on, and um, what it does is rather than look at the technology as, as what's most important, as the core of the discourse, people will say, you can't fight technology. Um, if you draw that out, that's actually a pretty scary philosophy because what it says is, we have no agency. The technology is telling us what to do. We're not telling what the technology should be used for. Um, and, you know, what I suggest is, what's really important here is this concept of rights and artist rights and copyright and... Why have we invented this mechanism of copyright? What's it good for? How long should it last? Um, and then you're actually getting close to the real issues. And, um, and you can say, well, how long should this right last for? How long should the terms be? Um, but a lot of that has just been glossed over over the, the last decade plus. And, but I think now people are starting to recognize, um, I mean, the fact is Google censors their own networks all the time for spam. Um, so, you know, the same tools that they could be using to more effectively uh, marginalize these, what are essentially black market distributors, sites like the Pirate Bay or Mega Upload, they're already using that technology. They're already, they're already censoring the internet um, in some ways. And, uh, you know, they'll also say, like, oh, if you do all this stuff, if you... Uh, if you actually go after these people, it's going to break the internet. This, I mean, this was the, one of the first lines that came out during the, the SOPA debate. Well, guess what? In the, in the United Kingdom, they've actually, you know, they have been blocking um, domain names. They've been blocking the Pirate Bay. I haven't checked the news today, but I'm pretty sure the internet is not broken. Um, you know, so a lot of these arguments just haven't... Censorship, you know, that's a big one. Um, they, they, they haven't been subjected to, um, you know, I think the attention that, 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 the critical attention that they deserve. Uh, I'm going to go jump back to a musician's point of view for a minute um, and then go back to the kind of more kind of legal conceptual stuff. For, uh, f for us as musicians, the cost of making make recording music uh, is can with technology it dropped way down you can make people make records quite often on their laptops so it doesn't cost an arm and a leg the cost or at least theoretically of distributing it, distributing it 
uh, online, like if you wanted to sell the music yourself on your own website, which I have kind of done, you can do that with a minimal outlay of, of money. But most people do it this way, where they, they're kind of selling it, and it g goes out through iTunes or Amazon or something else, and lo and behold, the percentage that they end up with at the end is pretty much the exact same percentage that they would end up with if they were the, the old model, decades old, with a regular record company. Um, so, in kind of this, we're jumping kind of more into the present day. I think this is from a survey that was done. Uh, Future of Music Coalition. Right? Yeah, Future of Music Coalition, and it was done not too, uh, not 2011. And they d they did a, a lot of respondents responded online, and then I think there were about 80 musicians or whatever that they really went into depth to find out, to look at their financial records to find out how were they living. Um, they're not getting a whole, this is 6% of what they get from uh, their income from sound recordings. That's, that's not going to pay the bills. Um, I pick jazz musicians because it's, uh, they play live a lot. Um, we know that jazz musicians, uh, they sell records, but most of them don't sell a lot of records. So I thought, okay, um, do they, is live playing, is b making, you know, doing live concerts, live performances, is that an alternative? If we're not making any money from uh, records, can we turn to live performances, as has been suggested, uh, and make money that way? Well, most jazz players can make 38% of their income that way. This chart, this pie chart, doesn't tell what, where the rest of it comes from. My guess is it's day jobs, um, whatever that might be. And because it's not record sales. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is what kind of, for a lot of people who consider themselves musicians, this is kind of what the average of what they make. It's about 35, 4,000, um, which is not, not nothing. Uh, but they're not doing that well. Um, and then there's other avenues that have been suggested. Like uh, there's people say, well, okay, you can go to Kickstarter and get your get your record funded that way. Or uh, and there there have been people who have done that and raised an incredible amount of money, one or two of them. <laughs> 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 but in general, that's kind of hard to do. And in general, it's kind of hard to raise money if people don't already know who you are. <laughs> um, that happens to be one of the arguments for giving stuff away free, because then the argument is give, away, give stuff away free and people will get to know who you are if they like it. Then maybe you can start charging later. Um, the other model is kind of corporate support. There are various forms of corporate support. Uh, there are companies that fund recordings and uh, they put the recordings in their ads and do all this kind of stuff and there are uh, here's some various you can put your name on perfume this is there's some country music there's Halle Berry but there's some other ones too there's some <laughs> there's some country singers in there who have some perfume and <laughs> um, that's not a I mean, I have some ideas, some scent ideas, but it's not, <laughs> I don't think it's really going to work for me. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yes. You don't know unless you try. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then there's, the, then there's the other argument, uh, which I have argued when I, my personality splits and I talk to myself. <laughs> I say, that was it. That was the era of recorded music. Uh, it lasted a hundred years, and now it's over. And uh, we're basically back to being kind of troubadours or whatever, wandering the back roads with our guitars over our shoulders and getting money where the, when the village needs someone to play at a wedding or a celebration or something like that. I don't think that's very <laughs> realistic either. <laughs> and I mean, uh, that's okay. The other alternative was like, yeah, corporate patronage would be the equivalent of being supported 
by the king uh, or the, you know, Mozart and all, all these guys working for royalty. Um, nothing personal against them, but that kind of support, not in a very obvious way, but in a subtle way, it starts to affect mm -hmm. what you do. Uh, it really does affect what you do. Um, and you mentioned in the book that you could make a lot of money licensing your songs. Yes, I, I, I make probably more money licensing songs to TV shows and movies than I do in record sales. But I, I think I'm what would, I'm afraid to say it, but I'm sort of what's called a heritage artist now. <laughs> That's a heritage act, right? A heritage act, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, <laughs> what the, yes, there's, we have her uh, there's a heritage bookshelf in the stacks back there. <laughs> <laughs> what, that, what that means is people already know who I am. Um, and, and so I, d I don't need the kind of money to get, get my name out and stuff like that. And uh, so I'll, I'll get paid for that. And I don't sell, sell my material to uh, commercials or political campaigns or things like that. But, uh, and that's where a lot of the real money is, even more, than, more than movies even. Um, but a lot of emerging artists, th okay, so that's all well and good for me, but emerging artists can't do that because nobody knows who they are. Uh, it, I mean, occasionally somebody will go, I heard this great band, they'd be great for the scene in a movie, and you hear something completely new on a TV show or in a movie, but that really doesn't happen mm -hmm. all that much. Um, I, and I want to make a distinction here because, you know, talking about all these different new methods of just, dis not distribution, but new ways that you can make an income and Kickstarter, um, I think there's a kind of a, uh, a false notion that somehow um, there's a zero-sum game. Like, okay, now because of the internet, uh, people don't pay for music anymore, but look at all these opportunities. So that's supposed to be the yin to the yang. Um, but when you think about it, there's no real contradiction there. And David makes this point in his book that it's very ironic, and I would say it's, you know, it's sad that at the moment when the costs of recording are going down and artists um, can make the song that they want, the album that they want, they have, you know, arguably more freedom than they've ever had before, the distribution model is collapsing. So yeah, you can make the music that you want to make, but in terms of having a career and finding funding and paying your rent, um, you know, that stuff is collapsing at the same time. The question is, need it be? And, uh, you know, I don't know if, y if, you, if you more effectively dealt with foreign, I mean, right now it's foreign sites as far as the United States is concerned. The United States is not going to have another Napster. They're not going to have another LimeWire because the law is clear on that. It's gone to the Supreme Court. The Gro Grokster was another service, and they went to the Supreme Court and said, um, you can't hold us liable for what our users are doing. Um, it's not our, you know, we don't know, we're not liable, we're not secondarily liable. And the decision was unanimous against them. Um, and the, if you read the legal decision, it's pretty interesting because they're just saying, you, what are you guys talking about? Just do a little, you know, do a search. You say you don't know what's on your network. Do a simple search of copyrighted material and you will find, as we did, um, you know, a massive amount of this, of this stuff. And so it's interesting because in the United States, the legality is sort of settled. Um, and now the issue is how do you deal with these foreign sites and can you do anything about it? And then again, that's what, that's what we had with SOPA. But, you know, I'm, I just think, y you know, you can view this in terms of opportunity. Do we want a society where artists have more opportunity or less opportunity. Clearly, you don't want that opportunity, opportunity to be you know, infringing on anyone else's rights, but that's not what this issue is about. You know, we're talking about how do you uphold artists' rights um, and do that in a, 
you know, in a reasonable way. So I fear we are missing out on, on a tremendous opportunity because um, all of a sudden we have this perfect distribution network called the Internet. It doesn't matter if you live in the middle of nowhere with no record store. You can participate now. That doesn't matter, and that's a great thing. Um, but if nobody's getting paid, you're going to have reduced quality um, of that content, and you're just going to have less opportunity for, for you know, the most ambitious, the most creative artists who uh, probably aren't going to find the support of a patron. And if they find the support of a patron, it's not going to be terribly significant support. There's one guy I interview in the book who works at um, Excel Recordings. He's the vice president of marketing there. And he talks about this interesting change that's happened within the indie music sphere where um, maybe five years ago, you do a song for a Mountain Dew commercial and license the song and get $60,000. The band gets $60,000. But what Mountain Dew figured out recently um, through this company called Cornerstone Promotions, which facilitates a lot of these exchanges of corporate patronage to independent um, artists, they figured out, hey, we can actually start our own label, and it'll be the Mountain Dew label. It's called Green Label Sounds. And instead of licensing a song for $60,000, they're paying $5,000 or $2,000 and saying, oh, we'll, we'll release your song, and we'll do all the marketing, and we'll do all the promotion. And now they're getting the same thing out of it, Mountain Dew, but they're paying the artist even less. But, you know, if you're creating an environment where artists are more and more desperate um, what other options do they have? Because, uh, you know, musicians, I don't know, musicians have all sorts of different opinions, but there is this general culture and attitude in which your fans can't really be trusted. I mean, nobody is depending, nobody assumes, as you probably did, that, hey, if I release this, the people who like it are probably going to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's, it's possible to fall in love, you know, have your favorite artist and love all their albums and to not have purchased any of their music. And, um, you know, maybe you've streamed their music and that's licensed. I'm not, I'm not anti-streaming necessarily, but, um, I don't know. It's a, it's a very interesting development, I think, in the culture where now we love these, we love the music so much and yet we're exploiting the artists who made it for us. Um, it doesn't Here's bode very well. You mentioned streaming. I, I, um, that kind of entered my consciousness recently as uh, there's a streaming service, Spotify, that has started to make inroads here in the United States. They've been established in Europe for a while. And what they basically do is they allow you to stream to your computer or your mobile device or whatever any song, any artist, any album, whatever, that you want instantly. And I think it works in tiers. If, if, if you, there's a free level where you get ads every once in a while, and then you pay a subscription free, and you get it without the ads, and there's a premium version and all that sort of thing. And uh, it's was heralded as being a savior in some ways because people thought, oh, okay. Maybe this will be another revenue stream for for artists. Um, so I did some research to find out, okay, let me pick a song that was fairly popular of my own and see how much revenue was generated by this. I, I did this song a number of years ago uh, with collaboration with a DJ in, in uh, UK. It was a huge hit, like number one, number two song in all over Europe. And I thought, okay, that's got to be a good test. Um, I made 100, 137 pounds from that. Hmm. And I thought, well, okay, <laughs> that is not a source of income. That's unsustainable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, the, the, the complicated fact is that these um, stream, streaming services, Spotify and Pandora is another one, have given many, many millions of dollars to the record companies to kind of smooth the way for them to have access to lots of material. Millions, I mean like $90 million. Um, the, the, none of that trickles down to us. There's no such thing as trickle down to the artist 
for those advances. Advances don't trickle down. It's when there's those get put in the pockets of the, the CEOs or whoever, and then they go out looking for more investments. And so it becomes this kind of, you know, Ponzi scheme of raising more money v of in for investments for these things, and none of it r trickles down at all. Um, <laughs> the money that does trickle down is comes after the investments, after these investments are done. So, yeah, but yeah, the, the big money has already come and gone. Where that that train left. Um, so anyway, that's those things are not a viable source of income either. But I'm curious where. I'm, not, I'm about to look at my watch. <laughs> I, am look, I just uh, noticed that we still have the perfume up. I there are no more slides. Fun. There's yeah. nothing. <laughs> there's we're nothing stuck after. With the, stuck with the oh perfume. Yeah, okay, we're definitely wrapping up. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> it's a, that's kind of a lot of bad news. Do a lot of bad news. A lot of do we have any good, uh, do you have any Well, the good news proposals? is that, yeah, there's good news. Uh, actually, uh, 2011 was the first year that... Um, Album, s album sales have gone up in the United States since 2004. So, um, you know, when I first started writing Freeloading, I f sort of felt like an opposition party uh, trying to get the president out of office where you want more bad news, you know, because it kind of suits your interests. But then my mentality changed a little bit where I saw like, well, actually, we all need some hope here, and that's really what's going to drive things. And, and in terms of the arguments that were made in saying, oh, this is, p piracy is natural and you can't do anything about it and this is just the, the nature of technology and it's too powerful. The fact that recorded music was going up in 2011 um, pretty much defeats that entire argument because what you had were people who, I mean, the cat was out of the bag. People could get music for free if they wanted to, but they were choosing to pay and more people were choosing to pay. Um, so that's very hopeful. I, I mean, that, that brings out the nature of choice, that we all do have a, a role to play and a choice in this, and um, you know, hopefully that will lead to a better conversation that revolves around artists' rights. But, you know, uh, I mean, I feel very positive in terms of talking about artists' rights and um, just acknowledging them, because when you're dealing one-on-one -on -one, um, and you say, uh, well, do you think it's okay to knowingly uh, you know, violate an artist's rights and, and take what they've made and, and just steal it, essentially. Very few people are going to say that they think that's, like, a good thing, that they think it's morally justified. Um, but that's, in essence, what's, what's happening. The challenge now is really building a sense of hope that, you know, you may feel that way, but there are other people out there who also feel the same way. And um, I'm hoping that my book and other books, and, and David Lowry certainly is really lead, leading the charge on this, will you know, spur a, a greater discussion where people acknowledge, hey, this matters, our decisions matter, and if we screw this up, this digital revolution, um, you know, th that means we are gonna have, we might have more art, actually. I mean, the quantity might be greater, but the quality um, in all likelihood is gonna be uh, far lower, and that's going to have profound uh, consequences on our culture and how inspired we are, how connected we are, um, how hopeful we are. Um, so I think that's a, I hope that's a persuasive <laughs> argument. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But, you know, w the difficulty now is, okay, I, you can have this conversation with younger folks, um, my generation, maybe Generation X, um, who are more familiar with this issue, but then you have this other problem of legislation, and what do we what do we do about it? You know, you can't just ask people to be nice. That'll get you a little bit of help, but um, you're still going to be dealing with a situation where there are incentives out there for foreign companies to be facilitating piracy and freeloading, and they'll be making money on it, and that's a problem. So, what do we do about that? Um, I think. If there's a lesson to be taken from SOPA, it's that, you know, we should, we need to be careful about whatever we do. And in terms of blocking websites, 
even though I think in some cases it, it might be justified, and actually the U.S. government already does it in terms of domestic sites that are violating the law. Um, the most important thing right now would be to focus on ad networks, many of whom are run by Google. So Google, Google is profiting immensely from um, the fact that there is no regulation of, of these foreign sites and, um, and payment processors like, like PayPal. I mean, one of the amazing things is that not only are people downloading music for free and knowingly violating artists' rights, but they're actually subscribing to um, these services called VPNs that encrypt what you're doing online. So people are actually paying money in order to steal the music, to feel like they're, you know, they, they won't be touched. Um, and the same thing happens with a lot of cyber lockers. They're, they basically are membership services, and you pay a certain amount of money to subscribe to the cyber locker, so then you have this you know, unlimited amount of free stuff to get. So what do we do about them? I mean, that, that's, that's the real challenge, but I'd also say that um, copyright terms are a real problem, and it's very difficult to have an argument about fairness and fairness to artists when um, there's essentially no public, I mean, there's, there is a public domain, but the whole idea of copyright was, okay, artists, you know, writers back in the United Kingdom, they're being exploited. They're writing these books, but we have all th this uncontrolled um, market of printers who are printing their books and selling them themselves, and the artist isn't getting any money, and the first copyright law the Statute of Anne in 1710, said this is to the great detriment of, of these men and, and their families, and um, you know, this is making it less likely that works of genius are going to get out into the world. So that's the reason why, wh that's where it came from. And the bargain was, okay, we give these private rights to the authors, so they're incentivized, and they can actually profit from this stuff and not be exploited. Um, but at the same time, we cut that right off, the, the, you know, we, 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 it's a limited right. So the original term was 28 years. Um, and then when the United States adopted copyright in 1790, the first copyright law, they kept it at 28 years. So they had 80 years to, say, to think like, oh, okay, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? They, they kept it the same, but they also expanded it to map makers and illustrators. So anyway, uh, it went from 28 years to 56 years dot, 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 now it's lifetime of the author or of the musician, plus 70 years. Um, so in terms of the public domain, you know, okay, so uh, this, my, my book, I don't know how long I'll live. <laughs> 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 I don't want to make any predictions there. <laughs> but let's say, you know, I, I live till I'm 70 years old. So what is that? 30, that's a, that's, that's a hundred years. And the, g the next generation is not going to have the chance to, um, not that they'll want to necessarily, but anyway, th the point is that whatever culture is being produced isn't going to be as efficiently available. And another sad thing is that um, when we could be having um, a sane public domain uh, and we have this tool of the internet, which is perfect for a public domain because now it's so easy to access stuff, it would be so easy to access these available works, um, we can't because of these protections. And it just, you know, strikes me as a tremendous missed opportunity. So can we bring those two sides together? Can we reform copyright terms and at the same time um, actually protect the rights of artists who are under term? I, I, that's the, uh, I think that's the goal now. And can you bring those two sides together? It's not going to be easy. But... Um, I think the fact that you that you've kind of taken on this subject, David Lowry and, some, and a lot of other people, there's been a whole shift in, thi in thinking um, and time has passed, a decade or so has passed. And so it doesn't seem like you're supporting kind of a bunch of rock dinosaurs. Right. It, it seems like you're supporting people, your peers, people like yourselves, pe people that in the neighborhood who are struggling to survive in their case as musicians. But the same thing, is definitely going to apply to writers and everybody else and any, any kind of content, any, any, anybody who makes content, it's going to apply to them eventually. Uh, and eventually it's going to apply to people who make physical objects when 3D printers become ubiquitous because then anything you invent, somebody can send the file to somebody else and they can make it somewhere else. Uh, 
so it's a it's an issue that's not going to go away, and it's uh, to me it's heartening that it's being talked about in a, with a kind of new perspective. Uh, we don't have answers, but <laughs> but now we're going to take questions, aren't we? <laughs> This is, yeah, this is a good time to leave. We're only going to do questions for <laughs> about 10 minutes, so let's not have too many. <laughs> but this is a good time to leave if you <laughs> need to be somewhere. Hi. Hi. Um, you, you mentioned the hammer. I, I see it more like a printing press than the Gutenberg press. Uh, and also, um, it took about 300 years to get to the patents. And for the first 100 years or so, the Catholic Church held on to it. Um, the hope is that uh, the uh, companies that are, you know, it wasn't so great for artists in the 60s. Even though there were a lot of companies paying good artists, like yourself, there were a lot of good artists who didn't make it. And if you look at the numbers from the artist's perspective, it didn't change too much. But now the hope that I see happening is uh, YouTube is now saying, I don't just want to have a one-hit wonder. I want to get companies to look at young people who will be more than he bit my finger. Uh, and they're, they're investing in uh, young artists because those ad hits are very good for them when they get uh, the equivalent of David Burns mm -hmm. coming up and getting 20 hits. So that's where the change, they're becoming the record companies that were in the 60s. Uh, so the question I have is, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, so do you see th that hope of, of change coming? I do. I, I, think that, I think it's the opportunity is out there, but um, I mean, something I talk about the book is rather than getting in this very depressing uh, sort of perpetual discussion about how terrible everything is and how all these industries are dying, rather than talking about how, to, how these industries are dying, can't we talk about building a better industry, building an industry that's better for the artist, that's better for the young artist, and you know, I think that drives you to figuring out, is there a way to, um, you know, for independence at least, to be giving a better royalty? Is there a way that artists can organize? I mean, before they can organize, there has to be a goal. But I think that potential is out there. Um, I hope so. I mean, it's depressing to see that major labels, actually, they're, they're probably just as dominant as they ever were. Um, and and uh, anyway, do you have anything to... No, I, 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 I don't know. Hi. Um, so first of all, thank you. This is obviously an enormous topic and you guys have touched on hundreds of different elements of it. Um, I just want to ask a question from a, a slightly different perspective. I'm part of a, a small team here in New York that runs an online community of over 800,000 musicians. We create content for record labels, for brands, for publishers. Um, we distribute content to YouTube. We work with Spotify. We work with all of these different places that you've touched upon from one angle. and. All of those people also bring enormous opportunity to our musicians to get their music out there, to get placed in independent films, to get placed in brands like uh, Bacardi and Red Bull and Converse. And there, there is a lot of good that's there. And I think you make a really good point about it not being a zero-sum game. How do you, you know, how do you take advantage of the power of that capability while also trying to regulate it? And you know, not to leave the question, but to me, it seems like you you touched a lot on like the the. ISPs and the labels, and those are the people that are often in control of, of how the, the money gets distributed, but it seems to me like it's more a devaluing of, of the, the value of music, not just whether people are paying for it or not. I mean, what is a, what is a song worth, and who's, who, who defines that now when you know, there's a lot of value to giving it away for free, and there's also a lot of detriment to it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, the customer decides what the value is um, by paying or not paying, or you know. That, so, the, so the customer is actually in the position of power there. I'd say that um, the thing is that that opportunity is going to be there. 
whether the rights are being respected or not. At least that's the way I see it. You know, the, if an artist wants to give their music away for free, there's never been an easier time to do that. Right. And actually, if a sort of a thought experiment, let's say that these rights are being protected in a reasonably, you know, serious way, well, that actually gives a competitive advantage to the non-rock dinosaur who is trying to come up because if you're not, if you know, you know, for now, we can't expect to get paid for our music, you actually can give it away for free when established artists are going to be charging money. That's good for the small artist because so they're how at a... how do you then charge for it down the line? I guess huh? How do you then charge for it down the line if you've been giving it away, to your point earlier? Well, you, you start charging for it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. I'm sorry, David. No, no, no. You want to answer <laughs> Hi, you talked quite a, uh, you touched on the conflation between sort of the digital revolution and this concept of piracy and them sort of blending together. Uh, I think part of the issue is, is that it's not necessarily that, that people don't want to protect rights, the artist rights, but how they're being protected. How do we balance between being able to grant these controls, this regulation, without abuses of that? How do we not see, I mean, you touched on uh, SOPA and sort of gave a laugh to it destroying the internet, but technical professionals had a pretty strong defense of the of DNS sec stuff. Right. Yep. And but the tools that are already in place, when you see things like the digital, digital Millennium Copyright Act and takedown notices for the Mars rover landing happening live, how do you sort of balance those things? Because the tools that have been in place have often been abused. Well, uh, I mean, how often have they been abused? I guess that's the question. Google says about 37% of the requests they got. But in their transparency report, it was, it was far lower than that. Okay, fair. Th yeah, that was a quote I actually heard about recently sure. that some spokesman in the UK gave. I mean, I don't... Uh, my, my feeling is um, the focus should be what I consider black market, market distributors. Right. In terms of individual downloaders, yeah. I'm, not I'm certainly not comfortable with the RAAA lawsuits. Um, I don't okay. think that was good for anybody, and I don't want to see that. Um, and that's a sticky issue. So I think what's not unclear to me is um, going after folks like Mega Upload or Pirate Bay, sites where the people using the site and the people running the site both know what they're in business for. Right. Now, how do you do that? Of course, you're right. I mean, it's a great question. How do you do that without... Stifling I, something else. Just lastly, I think the most salient thing you touched on is YouTube is a really difficult mix of those two things because you have mm -hmm. great power in Google and the individual user, and it's where you see sort of that gray area, and particularly the sort of fair use thing you touched on with uh, Lawrence Lassig as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hypothetically speaking, and I guess this is more of a question for uh, for Mr. Byrne, if you were in the infancy of your career now. How would you have dealt with today's environment, and would you have done it for the love of music anyway? Uh, what, would, what would I do now? It's it's hard to tell. I look at I look at kind of emerging musicians now and seeing what they're they're doing, and they're kind of working with companies that are helping them out in some kind of way, and they're or doing music for an ad if they have to or doing whatever they doing whatever they're kind of scraping by doing whatever they have to do and I think if it means something to you that you do what you do kind of you do what you have to do and uh, I think I would probably do the same thing that's kind of the environment we live in but I yeah and I think that put it, I mean this whole situation puts an artist in such a difficult position because what else are you supposed to do other than deal with what's happening? You know, you have to deal with what's happening if you want to be making the music and trying to have any career. But then how do you take issue with what's happening? I mean, when I, when I started off, I had, for a while anyway, I had a day job. So you'd work doing something in the day and then play music at night. But eventually, if you're gonna, really going to get serious about the music, if you're going to tour, if you're going to travel, do all that kind of things, you got to you got to be able to quit your day job, and th then you got to really figure out, wow, am I going to make enough money 
to, to feed myself and all that. Thank you. Hi, first, thank you. Um, in 2005, I worked for a now defunct company called Overpeer, protecting uh, copyrighted music on peer-to-peer -peer networks. And my job was to try to convert pirates to purchasers. And we were converting between 1% and 2% to purchasers mm -hmm. when iTunes was just an infant. Why had, and, and, they are, and basically the I, I, RIAA said, uh, you can't do that. And ultimately, the company went out of business because the labels wouldn't pay. Hmm. So why hasn't the industry, especially the RIA, embraced digital in a way? Like, isn't the problem that they didn't embrace the fact that there's this disruptive technology happening and find ways to monetize it in the early days instead of fighting what they were losing and still losing in the piracy battle today? There's a, there's a lot of mistakes that were made. Um, I know some of them were because the record companies did not want to embrace digital because it would have seemed like um, sabotage to the brick and mortar stores, to all the stores. There used to be these things called music stores, record stores. <laughs> and, and they carried a lot of weight. That's where, whatever, 80%. 90% of the music was sold through these physical stores, and the record companies didn't want to go against that. They, didn't, they thought, if we support digital, if we, for instance, make a deal with uh, a peer-to-peer -peer sharing site, if we start selling digital files on our own websites, that's going to really piss off the, the Sam Goodies and Tower Records of the world. And they were probably right about that, but they were caught between a rock and a hard place. Well, they, they, they couldn't embrace the new technology because most of their income was coming from this old thing, and who would have basically just said, uh-uh, you're, you're not doing that, because then you, every, if you sell downloads on your website, you're killing us. And, you know, the idea that they could have done something about Napster or license it, I... I sort of present that as a myth in, in the book. Um, there's another book by Steve Knopper, who's a writer for Rolling Stone, called Appetite for Self-Destruction, which has a great summary of, of the history, of this history. But um, he reports that Andy Grove, uh, who was the head of Intel, actually gave advice to the Napster guys at the time that copyright was not going to be protected online. So he, so he was telling them, don't worry about it. Because of the Sony Betamax case, which said, personally, you know, if you're using, if this is personal use and there's, it's not necessarily legal, then it's okay. They assumed that that was going to be um, used as the basis for, for digital copyright. Um, so they, you know, they didn't really have much interest <laughs> in making a deal at the time, and they didn't until after the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled against them. Then all of a sudden, Napster really wanted to work with them and make a deal, and reportedly, um, from you know, one of the people who were was privy to that negotiation, the deal that Napster offered was a billion dollars, flat billion dollars, for um, all the rights to their music. And that was at a time when the, the industry was $14 billion a year. So it was not a serious deal. Um, and then, of course, after that happened, there were also all these other Napsters that originally, so, so what do you do? And also part of it is, you know, part of the reason why people were so drawn to Napster was because it was different and because you weren't paying for the music. That's what excited people. Um, even people in the industry who knew that it was a problem. It, everybody was sort of excited by this, this revolution. Great. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my question is about quality. Um, I'm a writer and a filmmaker and a sometimes still photographer. And I've noticed in all three of those areas in the digital file sharing era, shall we put it, the last 10 years, the quality of a lot of the work uh, that I see around has actually dropped. I mean, news photography used to be kind of an art form back in the 80s. It isn't anymore. Um, you know, just for, for one trivial example. And it seems to me that the audience has become habituated to very low quality stuff. It's good enough. I mean, you, you go to YouTube, you'll, you'll watch a movie in terms of fidelity is the equivalent of taking an old vinyl LP and dragging a piece of sandpaper across it. And then, you know, sticking, I mean, the, 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 the resolution <laughs> uh, is the fidelity is, is absolutely unlistenable in a, in a visual sense. Yet, yeah, yeah. My question is, 
do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, <laughs> um, <laughs> you talk about it in the book. Yeah, yeah. And if so, uh, what should one okay. do about that? I agree that I agree that uh, I think what I might have said was that if people are given a choice between quality and convenience, they're going to choose convenience every time, and that's what we do. And uh, we see we're watching movies on a fuzzy little screen that big, and we're listening to our, our records, our music on things that sometimes the, the same the same device. Which that said. I remember that the first time I heard some kind of rock and roll or pop music or whatever, uh, when I was or kind of adolescent or something, it was on a little transistor radio that probably sounded worse than a phone. <laughs> and it completely changed my world, to hearing just like a couple of songs. And it, worst sounding thing you can ever imagine, you know, little <laughs> <laughs> changed, changed my life. So, I guess that made me realize, it, sorry, it sort of doesn't matter. Um, as long as you can read the type, a book is going to work for you. It doesn't matter if it's on really nice paper or not. Sorry, McSweeney's did an incredible job <laughs> with my book, but... <laughs> but, <laughs> but to move somebody... It's, it's the music or the words or whatever it else that really does it. And it can, it can, yeah, it can be a shitty little <laughs> movie on a phone, and it, it can get people really excited. It, I'm, I'm sorry, it would be wonderful. It's wonderful. Well, I, I pay to go see stuff in IMAX, but not too many other people do except kids <laughs> and, their parent, and their parents. Yeah. <laughs> but the quality, what about the quality of the stuff that's coming through the shitty transmitter there's too because much that's a there's way song. too much there's way too much music um there's way too much stuff out there way way too much um <laughs> but that's not it's it's not for me to be the filter and, and i mean that's that's part of our pro uh, problem is there's so much out there that how do how do any of us find the stuff that's actually meaning meaningful for us there's some it, as it gets easier to make music, there's more and more people m making it, and you can, you can, and there's more and more pe people making little films and videos and uploading them and um, doing all that kind of stuff. And it's just so endless. you still have to pay a lot of money for marketing and promotion, and you need a platform yeah, to you reach do. through. So just because you have access to this huge market doesn't mean anybody's going to hear you. Anyway, yes, we got to we we got to we got to go. Hi. Uh, so how do you feel about sampling in music? Uh, do you think it shows artistic creativity, or do you think it's a lazy way to make a song? Me? Yeah. That, you must be, must be for me, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's fine. I think it's a, it's, a, a, it's a creative tool that people can use to write. It's another way of writing. Um, I do think that, yes, if it uses a substantial and recognizable part of the song, then whoever did the initial recording and probably whoever paid for it, the initial recording, probably deserves to get something for it. Um, but whether it's a valid way of making music, of course, yeah, it is as much as anything else, yeah. Let me just say very quick, I'm a huge, grew up being a huge hip-hop fan, yeah. so... There's no way I couldn't appreciate sampling, right. you know. And um, one of the benefits to, although this is a fantastical notion in some senses, of a 50-year copyright term, which is what I advocate for in the book, is it would free up all of these old masters um, that anyone could sample from without having to yeah. deal with, you know, paying money for them, right. which is prohibitive in many cases. All right, thank you. So with the uh, oversaturation, undercompensation of artists, do you feel that genuine music is lacking right now? Do you feel that because of all this turmoil, I, I see it as cyclic, this has always happened in art, you know? So do you think there's just not good music out there right now for us? Not for me. There's, 
there's tons of stuff that I am, well, not tons, but there's plenty. <laughs> uh, plenty enough to keep me busy listening that I am excited about, that I'm moved by. I'm not having any problems. I'm not complaining. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I agree. Hi. Thank you both very much. It's been really amazing. Um, I was wondering if there are any particular things about uh, or what's some kind of new avenues for either creative expression or, um, you know, social networking or community building, um, what, if any of those, are really exciting to you that the internet has kind of provided or things that you think, I guess, kind of internet exposure for musicians cuts both ways and that, you know, the way that it cuts you is that it's not regulated and people can download it. People can download your music, but on the other hand, they, it creates new avenues for expression and new places that you can become heard. So I was wondering if there are any particular avenues or ways of doing that that you think are particularly interesting or exciting in the present that can kind of compensate for some of the ways in which the internet can be harmful. I, I think, I, well, I think Bandcamp is great. Uh, the fact that any artist can post their songs on Bandcamp, they can choose to allow downloads for free, or they can choose 50 cents a song or $1.50 a song. I think that's, to me, that's the ideal of the internet. Um, just more opportunity, more options um, to, the, to the creator, but that's also giving more opportunity to the consumer. Um, uh, I also think Kickstarter is great. I mean, I, I, I think that's a great development, and it's something that you really wouldn't have without the internet. So it's another case of you know, all the warm, fuzzy feelings that, that people do have about the internet actually you know, coming into fruition somehow. Um, an interesting thing is the Promo Bay, which is um, sort of run by the Pirate Bay guys. And it's, so what the Promo Bay is, is it's a way for unsigned acts to upload their songs and get some promotion and access to an audience. But the funny thing about it is that that just lays bare the fact, I mean, if the promo bay, I mean, that, there's the sharing. That's your sharing because there's consent of the artist. Um, there is this, you are helping promote, promote their works. Um, but then what about the pirate bay? You know, it just shows you that it doesn't have, to, it's not, there are distinctions to be made between how these services are operating and, and what they're giving. But I think all of those, I mean, I think the promo bay is great. I think that's more, oppor the more opportunity that there is for artists, the better. Um, I was wondering about looking towards the future, um, talking about this growing wave of piracy. Um, I heard, or what I sort of took away towards the end was that you were talking about government regulation and uh, you know legal intervention, and then you were also talking about sort of a collective moral realization. Um, so I was wondering, do you guys think that those two things are... Uh, strong enough to make a dent in what's happening now, or is there another thing that might do it? You, Chris uses uh, examples of, of, I think it's you, maybe it's, <laughs> I'm, I, I I'll might fact be check the, you might here. Be, yeah, yeah. Um, that it's easy enough to steal things from people's houses. That's not that hard either. You can, you could, you can break into people's houses, especially in the suburbs, and take stuff. <laughs> It's not hard to do, and yet we don't, well, not that many people do it. <laughs> Unless you have a good reason. We have made a collective decision that we don't do that, and it's not just because somebody might have a gun. I mean, you can get around, you can wait until nobody's home, but we don't do it, and we have decided as a society, we don't do this. And we can, we can make this decision, too, in the same way. Without the social norms, the government intervention is never going to work. And that's the, you know, we can debate about SOPA and whether it was good or bad or the provisions, but um, the reason why people could be scared to the degree that they, that they were and, and uh, well, anyway, it was because there wasn't that groundwork of 
sense of community or morality or you know a conversation about what's right and what's decent. So I think both things definitely need to have to have need to happen. There may very well be a third thing, but it, I I think I'm unaware of it right now. Hello, uh, I'm a student in high school. I like music. Uh, I was wondering if you think that maybe all of this, including the negative aspects, is just uh, a period of adaptation to a new system or a new way of that things would happen? It's an adaptation if the adaptation involves artists no longer having rights. And if that's what people want, we can have it, you know? But I, and I think, I think that's the issue. Like, there are genuine adaptations in terms of the fact that we listen to music on MP3s on, on our iPods. That's an adaptation. And the way that music is sold now, that's an adaptation. But I guess the one that I'm most focused on or the one that uh, scares me is the idea that artists' rights aren't really going to be respected anymore. And I hope that's not an adaptation that happens, but we'll see. Do you have any? Um, sort of already been answered, I guess, right now, but my question is, if you abstract for a second, as hard as it is, of the fact that there's a lot of opportunity being lost for artists to gain from their intellectual production, is it harder now for an individual artist, for an individual musician, to make a living out of music than it was before all that happened. I mean, Mr. Byrne himself had a day job until he was able to go directly into professional musician. Is it harder today to do that than it was before? I don't have the numbers, but it seems to me that it is harder. That uh, it, it seems to me that, I, I, as I said, I'm doing fine. But it seems to me that for emerging musicians, musicians who, as Chris writes, they seem to be incredibly successful. They're touring the country. They're on TV. They're, they're everywhere, or they're, they're written about all, uh, everywhere, and you think they've, they got it. They're, they're successful. They may not be, like, rolling in, rolling in money, but they're, they're going to be comfortable. They've, they've made a living. It isn't always true. It's hard. It's, it is harder. It is, it is harder for them now. And it's granted, granted there's, as I said, there's, it's easier for musicians to make mu music now, but it's, it's, and so there's maybe too much of it, but even the ones who have achieved a level of fandom and acceptance and listenership, whatever, though at, at that level you go, this person should be making a living at their art. At this, they've achieved, they have an audience that's this big, they should be living at that. They should be able to make a living doing that. And it's really hard for them. And we hope that changes. Because if we don't, if it doesn't, um, it'll get very quiet around here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're done. I'm going to take my shit. Uh, I think we're going to go.